Our gracious and eternal Father, as we pray as we go into your word, we ask that your spirit alone will teach us and guide us into all truth at this time. These mercies we ask through your son's wonderful name. Amen. Amen. All right, good night and welcome once again to another Wednesday night prayer meeting. And we, last Sabbath, would have completed chapter six in the Everlasting Covenant by uh, E.J. Wagner, and I see <laughs> Sister Joy smiling because I was supposed to download the same oh, session, but yeah, she can, she, yeah, it's that time, so she can listen now for tonight, and I will make sure she has it for the next time we go through. So we were, we, we finished there, uh, Wagner entitled Chapter 6, The Covenant Sealed, and he was showing that the promise, which is, or the covenant, which is God's promise, is sealed because the promise, or the covenant, is really and truly God himself. Because in Genesis 15, he told Abraham the most important words in Genesis 15. He says, I am thy great and exceeding rich reward. God was saying to him, I'm going to give you myself entirely. This is a revelation of of who God is. This is a revelation of love. Remember, John tells us that God is love. And therefore, that is the very nature of love, to give and to give all. And it's interesting, in, in, as human beings, we like to give in degrees. And yes, of course, as human beings, there is a limit to our existence. But when it comes to love, which the God is love. There is no limit to God's love. God gives all, and that includes himself. As Sister White says, that in the gift of Christ, she said God gave all when he gave Christ. Mm -hmm. Remember Paul says in Colossians 2, 9, that in Christ dwells the whole Godhead body. Mm -hmm. God gave his entire self in his son Jesus Christ. And that lesson Abraham learned very well when he was about to slay his son. Because you imagine Abraham at this time is about 120. And this is a child that for so long he was looking forward to. And basically giving up Isaac was like giving up everything, all of himself. Because remember it was a very hard thing for Abraham to do. Abraham is thinking, how can I do this thing? And he knows there are other uh, issues that compound it. You have um, Sarah. Obviously, he tells her the plan is probably botched from uh, the beginning because she's obviously thinking that something is wrong. His reasoning is gone. And the plan is not going to go through. And he's going through this great agony. And it's interesting because before Christ is offered up, Christ also himself goes through a great agony. And that is the separation struggle that's occurring. Remember, when he's going through the, the great pain in Gethsemane, he, he, he's asking, Father, why are you separating me? Why am I going through this? Do I have to bear this cup? He's going through a separation struggle between him and his son. And now Abraham is suffering a separation struggle because now he's thinking, I have to give up my son. And he was like giving up, it was like giving up his entire self at that moment. And that is what the love of God is. God, he is that promise, that covenant to give himself. And if we are in that love and we have him who is love, which is the way of life, how is it that we can live in any other way? And that is what God would have us to understand. That the gospel is truly understanding what the way of life is and that better way is the way of love and that's why you, you realize what is the number one or the key word that you find in the book of hebrews quite often no well he's talking about sacrifice but there's one word there's one word that paul uses over and over again 
in almost every chapter of Hebrews. No. No, he uses a word Probably. called begins with B. Yes. Begins with B ends with R. Begins with B and ends with R? Yeah. How many letters? Six letters. B and ends with R. I can help you a little bit more. Two T's in the middle. Better. Better covenant. Yes. yes. Paul uses the term better over and over again. Because to the Jewish nation he was speaking to, he wanted them to understand what the way of life truly was. They thought that the way of life was in getting into ceremony and type and this and all that. And he's saying, you're missing the point altogether. These things were a sign. Yeah. Circumcision, as we just went through, was what? A sign of the right. righteousness that they already had, yes. which God worked on in their spirits, by the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. So this is what we are to learn. God wants us to understand that the better way is in the way of the Spirit of God. And God wants us to understand that the union between the Father and Son is perfect through the Spirit of God. And if we receive the Spirit of God, our union and our connection to God the Father and God the Son would be perfect as well. And that is why in John 17, Jesus prays for that oneness because he understands. He said, Father would have them to be one, even as you and I are one. So therefore, if the Father and Son are one through the Spirit of God, it means then for the church to become one with God, what must they have? The Spirit of God. Amen. And this is why Sister White says that there was one theme that thrilled Christ's soul, that of the Spirit of God. And this is what Christ was always speaking about, praying for. And that's why when Jesus said, I think it was to Peter, he said, Peter, I have prayed for you yeah. that your faith Fair enough, because Satan wants to sift you as we. So what Jesus was doing was praying for him to receive the Spirit of God. Because you remember what was what Jesus said to him after that? And after you are converted, do what? Strengthen Strength your brother. So Jesus was really saying, I was praying for you to receive the Spirit of God in its full measure. Remember in John 4, it says of Christ that he did not receive the Spirit by what? By measure. So therefore, God is saying that he wants us also to receive the same spirit, the, the spirit of God in the same measure in which Christ received it. You understand? Because we have been adopted into the family of God and have received the same eternal life of Christ. Do we understand what God has done for us in Christ? That he has given to us the very eternal life of God has made us sons and daughters of God because, listen, if he has made us sons and daughters of God, when you give, let's say you give your inheritance to your children, you split it evenly if you're are a fair parent. Amen. Amen. You split it evenly. But that. You have issues in families where um, want the mother liked one son or daughter a little better, so they give them a little All bit more depression. And the word inheritance here is important. Because the Spirit of God, there's a word that Paul uses in the Greek to apply to the inheritance or the Spirit of God, that of a down payment. God gives us the Spirit of God in a down payment in a particular measure so that we can receive more and more and come up to the very fullness of God. And of his fullness have re received grace for grace. And remember, Sister White says that the grace of God is the Spirit of God. And it means then that we're to be drinking in more and more of the Spirit of God day by day. Mm -hmm. And that is why he says, Hosea, if you follow on to know the Lord, his goings forth, I, I always misquote this, so if you follow on to know the Lord, mm -hmm. <laughs> it means then receiving more and more of the Spirit of God. Because to really follow on to know a person means to follow on to know the spirit of that person. Because the real me, is this the real me? No. The real me is the spirit of Cephalus. The real John is the spirit of John Les uh, Oh my goodness. You know, it's funny. I just said John Leslie. I had my, my grandfather's name was John Leslie. So, but John, the, the spirit of John Rowe, the, the real John Rowe is the spirit of John Rowe. And that is why God wants us to understand that the spirit is what matters. 
That's what Jesus says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and, and in truth. This must be our subject and our study constantly, how we are to daily receive of the Spirit of God, because when we receive the Spirit of God, the fruits of the Spirit are to daily be growing in us. If we are not concentrating on having the Spirit of God, and when I say having, we are not to think of the Spirit of God as a force or an essence, as the world thinks of the Spirit of God. If you realize how Paul speaks of the Spirit of God, I was reading this morning in my devotion, Romans 8, 26. Now, when Paul speaks of the Spirit, speaking of those groanings or the utterances which the Spirit gives, he says, and the Spirit itself, but when you look at the word itself, another word that can be put there is himself. So the Spirit of God is a person. And we come in Amen. to true relationship with the Spirit of God by knowing Christ. Because Amen. the Spirit of God, when we are in contact with Him, is always speaking about Christ. Amen. You know, have you ever met somebody who is dating somebody new and all they can talk about is that person? Mm -hmm. In a similar way, this is what the Spirit of God is constantly doing. Speaking about Christ. So that's why He says, when the Spirit comes, He shall speak, He shall testify of me. Because of that relationship of love. God, through his son and through the spirit of God, is seeking to reveal to us that the Godhead is all about relationship. Amen. That is what it's about. And he's seeking to bring us in to that. Listen, now we hear the term that God wanted to create a family all of his own. But do we realize that there was already a family in heaven? God has simply expanded the family of God by creating uh, intelligent cre creatures mm -hmm. from the angels right down to humanity because there is that family of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Spirit in perfect relationship with one another in that spirit of love. So there was a perfect family already in heaven. So the people that ask, God, what did you do in eternity before you came to our world or before you created? What was it like? Was it boring? Was there no social relationships that was going on? And social, uh, social relationships is a, uh, you know, being social is a big thing now. You have social websites, yeah. social networking, all these social things. Media. And it is interesting that you have so much social networking and people are more disconnected than ever before. Antisocial. Yes, more antisocial and uh, they have no way of understanding how to relate to one another. It is only the Spirit of God that makes these things plain because there is that love, which is the white cause of disinterested benevolence. Every person we come into contact with, we must have a serious and sincere desire to impress upon that person the truth so that in every way we are willing to serve them to reveal to them that God is love. And that is, and when we do that, it has a deep impression upon their hearts and minds. So every person we come to contact with, that is why we're to have that willingness to serve, to reveal to them that this world is not all dark and gloomy, but God has impressed his, his own self in this world, in his son Jesus Christ. And he's given to his church, his son Jesus Christ, so that the church can reveal it to the world. And that is why Paul says he manifestly declares himself through his church and that is what he's seeking to do for us and as we have that in mind we're going to transition here and look at chapter 7 tonight just briefly on the test of faith so if you have it test of faith i don't think this is smart as it test of faith um, chapter 7 page 95 in the everlasting covenant all right, he says, beginning, we pass by a period of several years. The number of years we cannot tell, but Isaac, the child of faith and promise, had been born and had grown to be a young man. Abraham's faith had grown stronger and more intelligent, for he had learned that God fulfills his own promises. And how did he learn that? He learned that by coming in daily into a perfect relationship with God. He understood 
that God's promise is really himself. And therefore, remember the, what Paul says, that by how many immutable things? That by two mutable things, it is impossible for God to lie. And Paul, another place, says it is impossible for God to lie. And therefore, when he promises and he gives himself, he gives that, that is what Abraham learned, that when God makes a promise, he's really saying he's given his entire self into that thing. So that whenever we make a promise to a person to fulfill a thing, we have to show sincerely that we have given ourselves fully to that thing and to, uh, to fulfill it. And that is where we must put our all into what we do. And Paul says that whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do all that manifests the character of God, which is ultimately self-sacrificing and willing to give all for the salvation of man. He continues, but God is a faithful teacher and does not allow his pupils to leave a lesson until it is thoroughly learned. So what does God want to do? He wants us to uh, learn a lesson and learn it thoroughly. Just a quick question in here. Um, is everyone, is it too warm in here or is it the condition? It's hot? Yeah, manage all right. All right. He says to leave a lesson until it is thoroughly learned, it is not enough for them to see and acknowledge that they have made a mistake in the lesson he has given them. Such acknowledgement, of course, ensures forgiveness. But having seen the error, they must go over the same ground again and possibly many times until they have learned it so well that they can go without stumbling. So God wants us to learn these lessons and to specifically learn these lessons of faith and, and of trust in him. Abraham made that mistake constantly, not trusting the Lord, not uh, realizing that he was a person that always fulfills his promises. Realize, I said, that God is a person who always fulfills his own promises. He does not need any additional work from Abraham to fulfill his promise. If God made a promise, only God can keep the promise. Abraham had to not put forth his hand to try to keep a promise that God made. So God made that promise and he fulfilled it. And he fulfilled it when, when Abraham believed it to be so. And you see the love of God? God does not force anything. As much as he wanted Abraham and Sarah to receive that promised child at that time, he says, it is not until they receive faith in me and in my ways of operating that then they will receive that promised child. So they must go over the same ground again and possibly many times until they have learned so well that they can go without stumbling. It is solely for their own good. It is no kindness on the part of a parent or teacher to allow his children to pass by lessons that are unlearned simply because they're difficult. And you know, it's interesting we do that sometimes. We like to hurry people up, or bring out our children as he uses the illustration here. We like to hurry children up to go on to certain concepts. And I would say that growing up in the Caribbean, uh, not that... My, the teachers didn't do as, the best job that they could, but sometimes Caribbean teachers have had a way of rushing concepts and of getting through this, the concepts quickly. And quite often, children still don't get it. And that is why uh, in certain schools for, for a good time throughout the Caribbean, there's not been that high of a pass mark as they could be because children are being introduced to concepts but are not learning the lesson. So therefore, when they come to a problem, they have no idea or don't remember how to do it. They have had no experience or marination in it. And seeing that we're talking about subjects and tests here, what is a test? What is a test? What is a test? It's an evaluation to see that you know what you know. Well, what you were taught, you know what you were taught. Right. It is an assessment. Yes, to see, mm -hmm. to see what is your experience with that subject. Mm -hmm. So you have people 
who put a person into a test and they have very little, if no uh, experience at all, with the subject, and therefore you cannot ex expect them to pass it. If we have very little experience in trusting God and knowing his ways of operating and his ways of dealing with men, how are we expected to pass the test when they come? So we have to come to know God, to have that experience with him, and understand it, how he operates, if we are to pass these tests. You remember what it is, was asked in Revelation? It says, when the Son of Man comes, um, shall he find faith? Yes. That is a serious question, you know. Mm -hmm. When the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith? Yes. Shall he find people who have learned God's ways, have learned his character, and his ways of operating, and have trusted them. Amen. Has he found people who have implicitly and have given them all? If God has given himself entirely in this covenant, God is saying, we also must give ourselves back entirely into it. And listen, what are we, you remember Sister White the question, what are we giving when we give up all? A sin polluted heart. And listen, if you think about it, who has more to risk? Us or God? Us. Of course, God. Yeah. No, think about it. No, no. In giving up everything, no, God gives yeah. up all of himself to us. And we give, and in turn, we are to give up all of ourselves to him for there to be a perfect relationship. But, it, but when we think about it, in terms of giving up all, who has more at stake or at risk? God. God. Because remember, Sister White says that when God gave Christ, he took a what kind of risk? A fearful risk in sending his son because the possibility of Christ failing, coming into our sinful world with sinful nature, was great. And if Christ fails, the entire universe is now given over to the way of sin. You understand? Mm -hmm. Not just a world. So it, it was a great risk that God has taken. So what are we really giving up when we give up all? We're really given a simple little heart. We are accepting Christ and we're receiving the new heart. You said the entire universe? Huh? The entire universe? The entire universe. The entire universe because now the fountain head, if Christ sins, okay. the entire, now there, there is the issue and I, that's not something I want to get into now, but mm -hmm. there, I brought it up, but the issue is about freedom of choice. The two thirds in heaven had chosen to go against Lucifer's way. So the question may be, how is it that this affects them? Yet the, their righteousness is a fool of God. So these are questions that I'm going to leave with, with you. I'm not going to venture into that any further than that before I've looked into it okay. much further, unless I send your mind where it should not go. <coughs> So he said, it is no kindness on a part of a parent or a teacher to allow his children to pass by lessons that are unlearned simply because they're difficult. So when we go through a test and a trial and we fail, we are not to become despondent and say, well, let me give up, give up Christ and everything. No, we have to understand that God wants us to learn a lesson and to come up to a point where, as he says, that we will not stumble. And that is what God is doing for us now. God is love. We need to understand that God's love is unconditional, you know. We think that God has a particular number. I remember when the disciples asked, so how many times should we forgive a man? Thinking that forgiveness and love has a limit. Understand that the limit comes when a person rejects the love of God. You understand? You understand what I'm saying? The limit necessary to the forgiveness of God comes when a person rejects the love of God because it is God's love that leads him to forgive men. So if a person says, I do not accept the love of God and his forgiveness, that is where the limit comes, not on God's part. So remember they asked, how many times should we forgive a man? And Jesus told them, 70 times 7. But really and truly, what limit is there? You, you, it is interesting, 490 is the, is the answer. And if you think about it, if you are thinking in your head, all right, I forgive this person, one, forgive this person, two, 
and you're going through it. There's a time that you're going to get to 490 and you say, I'm cutting off. Yeah. Anybody else who wants forgiveness, forget it. So what is that? When there's that person now that comes to you, number 491, who really deserves it, what is going to happen? Are you going to cut them off? So we have to understand that God's love is unconditional. And it is that love that leads him to let us learn that lesson. So we are not to think that, boy, I failed, I can't go far. No, God wants us to learn the lesson and to move forward from there. And this is what Abraham had to do. His failing in trusting God, God brought him through that. And ultimately, he had come to a point, and I believe that that test on Moriah, where he was to have to stay his son, was that ultimate test of faith that would have sealed him in trusting God and his ways of operating. And we all will have our test of faith, and that time is, is quickly coming up. We will be uh, shown to see uh, whether or not we trust in God's ways. Now he says the proof. So it came to pass after these things that God did prove Abraham and said unto him, so he was checking to see, you can say, well, that Abraham was trusting implicitly in God's ways. So God did prove Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, even Isaac, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. What it involved. In order to understand what this poor meant, we must have a clear idea of what was bound up in Isaac of what was embraced in the promise that had been made to Abraham, which was to be fulfilled through Isaac. We have already studied it, and so have only to recall the fact. God has said to Abraham, In thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed, and in Isaac shall thy seed be called. As we have seen, the blessing was the blessing of the gospel, the blessing which comes through Christ and his cross. But this, since God had so said, was to be fulfilled through Isaac, the promised seed, consistent of Christ and of all who are his, was to come through Isaac. Thus we see that to human sight, the requirement of God seemed like cutting off all hope of the promise ever being fulfilled. But the promise was the promise of salvation through Jesus Christ, the seed. So Christ is that seed. So there was no cutting off of that promise. I remember we are told that Jesus Christ is that one who is blessed forevermore. So therefore, there is that eternal blessing which comes in being in Christ. And that is why the promise had to be made to him. Because let's say the promise was made just to Abraham per se, then where is any hope for us? But the promise is made to an eternal one, to that seed which is Christ, and we have that eternal blessing in him. And that is why everything is in Christ. And this message that Wagner is preaching here on the everlasting covenant was a part of that message of righteousness by faith. This is what they were trying to get across to them. It was all about Christ. It was all about having Christ as your portion. But yet we have made the gospel into many other things in terms of this doctrine that it, it comes and accepting Christ the person. It comes in that relationship. But you know, as God's people, we have a way of, so White says that there is that form of godliness that passes as a way of remembering him. We think that we, are, we really know who he is because we know the scriptures very well. Remember what Jesus said to the Jews? He says, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are there that testify of me. So Jesus says, in essence, you think that by studying the scriptures, seeing where it connects here or there, and understanding how to break it down and explain to the brethren, that you have eternal life in that, which is the work of your hands, and understand all that. But he says, you fail to re realize 
that the scripture speaks and testifies of me, and it speaks of accepting me as life and as your portion. And yet I am here before you, and in the spirit of Satan, not in the self-sacrificing love of the Spirit of God, you are rejecting me and seeking to kill me. They were seeking to destroy all relationship, all relationality, because for a sake of an intellectual understanding of the world. And my question to you tonight is, what do you value above everything else? Your intellectual understanding of the word of God, or knowing Christ really and truly, and having him as your portion? And these are, this is a question that we must answer very seriously tonight. Whether or not our joy is in that, or in knowing Christ really and truly. And our knowing Christ will be revealed in every situation. If we really trust in Christ, every situation we will come up to is where we will be trusting him more and more and say, like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And that is where we are to come. Where even though it may seem dark and uncomprehendable at the time, that we are still trusting God because of that relationship that we have with Him. And it's not that we are trusting a person that, to using that word fickle, we are not trusting a person who has failed and is picked back up. We are trusting a person who has never failed and has and cannot fail at all. But in our minds, we cannot conceive of such a person that is so perfect. Mm -hmm. So therefore, as the psalmist says, you, you thought that God was altogether such a person as yourself. You thought that God was a person who is sometime-ish and does not always keep his promises. That is not who, how God operates. And the psalmist is saying, I want you to elevate your thinking of God above that of man. And Paul says, we are not to bring the deity, we are not to bring God down to the level of these creeping creatures and down to the materials of this earth. I want you to think even higher. Think above all you know about this world and how man operates. And see God as one who is beautiful in the extreme. And seeing God who is perfect, I mean perfect, in the real sense of the word. A person who has never failed, nor will ever fail. And when you will think of God like that, it makes it easy, more easy every day to trust him. And it is, a, it is definitely something that must be learned because we have learned quite often to f be failed by others and to fail others ourselves. And this is why we have to come to know God as he really is. So this is what we have to consider. What do we value more? Knowing Christ as our portion, especially in every experience, because our life is really, however you think about it, Regardless of all that you read, our, our life is really contained in our experiences and how we react to those experiences. So we like to say, well, we like to read a good book and there's a good ideology and theory in there. But unless you have a positive response to every experience that you go through, it will, whatever experience you have will shape your life. And that is how the brain registers it, the mind registers everything is that. And mix up the composition of whoever that person is. So do you really value above all things? Do we really value above all things our intellectual understanding of the word of God or really knowing Christ the word? Continuing. So, but the promise was a promise of salvation through Jesus Christ, the seed. The promise had been very explicit. In Isaac shall thy seed be called, and that seed was first of all Christ. Therefore, Christ the Savior of all men could come only in Isaac's line. But Isaac was yet a young man and a married. To cut him off would be so would be so men would reason to cut off all prospects of the Messiah and so to cut off all hope of salvation. To all appearance, Abraham was called upon virtually to put the knife to his own throat and to cut off the hope of his own salvation. <laughs> Amazing how Wagner puts it in, that 
the slain of Abraham, uh, of Isaac, sorry, would have brought to have destroyed the hope of all and even Abraham himself because it was Abraham and his seed. And it's interesting, do you see a connection here between Abraham and his seed and God also and his son? Do you realize that unlike, um, well, I can't really say unlike us as well, because there is something that we are to learn from this world about how the Godhead operates. The father and son are seen as co-eternal. Now we may, I don't have any children, and you may think, well, how is it that Stephen's son could be uh, coexisting with him, even though he does not have a son? But we come down to the physical nature of everything. The person, uh, or it, the, even though it takes a sperm and an egg to fuse and to make a person, yet the uh, person is in, the, in, that child will be yet in my bowels as an individual right now until uh, whatever time it may come to perform and form that child. And that is just in our physical finite world. And when we come to God now, God the Father and God the Son were co-eternal, existing with each other. And as the wise man puts it, he says that of Christ, I was as one always by him and grew up with him. Amen. So Christ was always with God. You could say it this way. There was not a, a time where God winked and Christ was in there. Or there wasn't a time that God did anything and Christ wasn't there. And if that is so, Christ himself has to be what? Eternal. Amen. So many people not understanding this come and say that Christ is the only begotten Son of God and they take that to mean that he's begotten the way that we are. Amen. But God's ways are higher than our ways Amen. and God's begetting is much higher Amen. than our begetting. Amen. Now, he's, now we're gonna, this is the last paragraph. The, sever, the severest possible test. Thus, we can see that it was not merely Abraham's fatherly affection that was tried. You understand? It was not merely his fatherly affection that was tried. As parents, we have this strong bond and affection to our children that in many cases is just a parent, a parent affection. But that parent affection can also be very selfish because we are thinking about this child as ours and wanting our will for that child, yet not understanding that God has given that child to us to have a purpose in the finishing of this great controversy. So it was not merely a testing of his fatherly affection, but it was a testing of whether or not his loyalty was entirely to his relationship with God and to the plan of the, of the, of the great controversy. So it was not just fatherly affection as well, I can outline this here. It says, but his faith in the promise of God. A severe test no man was ever called upon to over undergo, for no other man could ever be in the same position. The entire hope of the whole human race was bound up in Isaac. And Abraham was asked apparently to destroy it with a stroke of the knife. Well, might the one who could stand such a test be called the father of the faithful. You understand? He is the father of the faithful. It is not known that he's just thinking of Isaac. He's understanding his greater relationship to the entire plan of salvation. We may well believe that Abraham, sorry, was strongly tempted to doubt if this requirement came from the Lord. It seemed to be so directly contrary to God's promise. And this is what it really, his experience really shows what it means to trust God implicitly. Because the command that came seemed completely contrary to God's uh, command. And we need to understand that whenever we receive a command from the Lord, we also must look at what God is also seeking 
to, for us to learn in this particular experience. Because God wanted ultimately for Abraham to realize what God was doing in the plan of salvation. So when you get to John 8, what does Jesus say to the Jews concerning that particular event? He says, Abraham did what? Rejoice to see my day I was glad. Abraham rejoiced to see that God had truly given himself entirely for the plan of salvation and to bring all of his creation, particularly humanity, into that family, back into the family of God, into that perfect relationship and oneness. And this is what we saw in the Garden of Eden, where there was a perfect relationship between Adam and Eve and God, and that there was no fear until sin came in. There was that joy to be in God's presence. And when sin came in, what, what, what was happening? Adam and Eve, having accepted the lie of Satan, began to run from God. Because if God is hiding something from you, according to Satan's uh, suggestion, suggestion, it means that God is a person you cannot trust. If he has such a covenant relationship with you, as though you are his wife, you are his bride, why is he hiding anything from you? And you know how things go on in relationships when a wife finds out that the husband is hiding something from her. Uh, it is a great controversy that goes on in the house mm -hmm. or vice versa. So, so, so if, if it is true, according to the suggestion that God is hiding something from you, why then go ahead and trust God? And therefore, if he cannot be trusted to give us his stuff, then, you know what? We'll run from him because he probably is seeking to take our lives as well. He's not probably the person that he revealed himself to be all this time. And God was completely genuine uh, regardless of how long they were in the garden before the rebellion. God was completely genuine with him all the time up until up at this point. And it was not until God revealed the plan of salvation to Adam and to Eve that they then learned that God truly is self-sacrificing and ultimately full of love and was not seeking to hide anything from them at all but to give them all of himself. And that's what God wants us to learn. God is our friend. He's not seeking to hide anything from us. He loves us entirely. He wants to give us He wants to give us all of himself. And he says, if I am like that and I give you all of myself, no reservations, no, not even a fear of being hurt. You know, a lot of times we don't give ourselves to people because we are afraid that they're going to hurt us. Quite often we do that. But God is saying, I'm not even afraid of being hurt. If I was, I would have pulled out of this relationship a long time ago. Because there's no person that's been more hurt than God in his great contrast. And you can go as far back as Lucifer and come forward to our present day. So he says, I'm giving myself entirely to you regardless of the pain or whatever it may be. I know that I love you so much that I would rather die for you than to, to take your life or even to think of taking your life. So if you see that type of love, will you not give yourself also unreservedly to me? And that is what God wants us to do. To give, him, to give ourselves entirely to him. Amen. To complete that circle of beneficence. When that circle of beneficence is complete, you know, we were, just to wrap, wrapping up, a couple of years ago in Barbados, Dr. Douglas was going through a series called Yahweh Circles. And he did not, uh, he, he went through the study in detail, and Ty Gibson also goes through it in detail in his book called uh, A God Named Desire. And it is revealed it says that the strongest bond, the strong, strongest chemical bond in the earth is sodium chloride. And just to do a little chemistry, sodium has, I believe, seven electrons. Mm -hmm. And you have shells within electrons, and there is one electron that is to be given to that which is seven to make eight to bring what scientists call a happy state or a perfect state. 
of that particular atom mm -hmm. or that particular mm -hmm. cell. It is revealed that when we read the scriptures, that there are currently seven complete circuits. Amen. And Amen, God is waiting for an heir to be completed. So Amen. there are things in nature that are teaching us Amen. about God's kingdom. And God is waiting Amen. for you and I to complete this circuit, to trust him implicitly, to give ourselves unreservedly to our faithful covenant partner and allow that circuit of love to be complete. Amen. Amen, Amen brother. All right. So we're going to close here with those things of mind and we'll turn up any questions or comments and then after that we'll have our closing prayer. All right. Let us pray. Our gracious and eternal Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your mercy and for your truth as it is in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Oh, Father, what amazing love that you have given yourselves unreservedly to us, even with the, without the fear of us hurting you. And Father, how have we hurt you throughout the ages, mm -hmm. those 6,000 years? But Father, we know that now you want to make this circuit complete. Mm -hmm. And you have revealed yourself as a God that can be trusted. You reveal that you are a God of ultimate love, that you are beautiful in the extreme, and that there is nothing that you are seeking to hide from us because you are an open book. You give yourselves entirely to us. Oh, and praise the Lord. Concerning your word, you tell us that there is no book in the word of God that is closed. It is entirely open and reveals that you are an entirely open person to all of your creation. So be with us, bless us this night with a knowledge of who you are in the experience of your character and that we can grow day by day in beholding you, coming into that perfect knowledge to reflect your character to the entire world and to bring others to a knowledge of your love. So be with us, bless us, and keep us in Christ we pray. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen, amen. and amen. That the words of our mouths, the meditation of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, Lord, the strength and the redeemer. Amen. <coughs>